may be seated. Y'all may be seated. I wanted to make sure. Uh, it wasn't today beautiful just to be able to come and sing praises to the Lord? Amen. I don't know about you. I wasn't always saved. And I'll tell you this much. I used to fight against you people that named the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. I would get mad when they would play Christian songs on the radio, rush either over to turn it off, or I would complain about it, point to it, and if you were singing a song talking about how much you love the Lord, you were a target. You were a target. I spent years doing that, trained, taught, fight against those Christian people that don't worship the true God. So when it, to be able to come into the house of the Lord for me, to be blood washed and have my sins washed away, God changing my mind, giving me the miracle that set my soul on fire opening the Bible, and it coming alive. Being able to talk to people and have an answer that I don't think is true, but I know it's true. That's everything for me. So when I say, didn't they do a marvelous job this morning, you know what I mean? I mean, that was a marvelous way to praise and worship God this morning. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Uh, giving honor to God who is the head of my life. Uh, <laughs> thank you, Lord for being a savior to me and a deliverer to me, for being a healer to me, for being the answer to me, for putting in my life that which I never earned and don't deserve. Thank you, Lord Jesus. How precious you are to your saints. There is none like you in all the earth or even in our imagination. Holy, righteous, wonderful, loving God. Thank you. Thank you. Giving honor to him who is the head of our lives. Giving honor to all of those who have secured him in their lives. To hold on to him. To say that loving Jesus really pays. Amen. And... And all the way down to the founding of this ministry and giving honor to all of you who come before the Lord to say, God, I want what you have for me today. Uh, two commercials right quick. Number one, this basket we talked about. Please, please, did you know that God said it? so that you would be able to come and bring your petitions before him. And yeah, you might not need to write it on a piece of paper and put it in this particular basket, but if you haven't put your petitions before the Lord, hold yourself accountable and say, God, I really am stepping up to the plate and I'm gonna ask you like you told me to. Amen. And the second commercial, right quick, is simply to please, uh, uh, got a word from Brother Eugene Shackelford, and he said, please tell the congregation that I think of them and I am thankful for all their prayers and text to me and to my wife to show that they care for us. And not to worry, I am strongly encouraged in the Lord and trusting in his plan for us. Brother Eugene, I went to visit him and I thought I was going to encourage him and listen to him talk. I wound up being encouraged and talking. Funny how that works, going to visit a saint of God. 
This month we have taken to uh, our time of sanctification, and for this month our theme scripture is from the book of 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse number 23. And the Bible says, and the very God of peace sanctify you wholly, and I pray God your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. What a theme for the month. But this part, this day, this particular week, our theme for today and for this week is from the book of Joshua, chapter 22 and verse number 20. Did not Achan, the son of Zerah, commit a trespass in the accursed thing? And wrath fell on all the congregation of Israel, and that man perished not alone in his iniquity. Our message, our, our sermon today is Lessons of Achan. The Lessons of Achan. And I got to put you on warning today. Today is a message for mature Christians. Today is a message for those who say, you know, God, I'm not playing around. I really want something that you got for me today. That is this message. So if you were expecting a sitcom, if you were expecting somebody to come up and tell jokes, if you were expecting just an instrumental something that might lull you off to a lullaby, you're in the wrong house this morning. This morning is a message, and it was a struggle, and I will tell you, thank you, everyone who called to pray for me and ask, and, and they also had a similar burning, because, you know, when, you, when you're real Christians together, there is but one spirit, and you'll find yourself in tune with that spirit. So having said all of that, could you bow your heads with me for prayer? Lord, Look at how marvelous and how wonderful. Look at how awesome you are and you do for your, your children, God. We get amazed at you all the time. And Lord, right now, we just ask as you have blessed us in worship and singing forth and in prayer, as you have blessed us so much already this morning, thank you for that. And Lord, we ask now that you have your hands on the sermon, on the, the word that is, goes forth and it is preached and laid in your altar this morning. We ask that you have your hands on it and then it would not return unto you void, almighty God, but it would accomplish in our lives that to which you send it to do. Amazing, amazing God. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We pray and claim in Jesus' name. And everyone said, amen. 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 The lessons of Achan, part number one. Part number one, the conquest of Jericho, something we need to talk about. But before we get to the lesson of Jericho, there are a few lessons we need to take heed to. If you were, uh, if anybody has been following along with us in our reading, we have read up and it, it keeps coming up to some sort of climax, some sort of thing that you have to grab onto. And then there's another thing that God wants you to grab onto. Well, in quick review, there are uh, five lessons we'd like to mention just quickly. The lesson number one, the lesson of Moses, as awesome and as holy as he was, he didn't make it into the promised land. As awesome and holy as he was, he didn't make it into the promised land. That's lesson number one. Lesson number two is the lesson of Joshua, who was Moses' minister, the Bible says, and did so not brashly, not obnoxiously, not remorsefully, but did so humbly and faithfully, and because of which became the leader of the nation the leader of the nation. No, le lesson number three, the lesson of dying in the wilderness of sin because of bad decisions. Dying in the wilderness of sin simply because of choosing the wrong thing. Lesson number four, the lesson of God rewarding, murmuring, and complaining. Murmuring and complaining. 
It irked God so bad that he just disappeared people, just wiped out some people. He said it was a stench, and he told Moses, get, just get from among them and let me wipe them out. The lesson that God showed a reward for murmuring and complaining. And lastly, the lesson of how God sought to take Moses' life for forgetting to circumcise his son and his wife, you know, the Ethiopian, his wife, uh, who the big leaders of Israel, Miriam and Aaron, complained about, his wife saved him and therefore the nation. But those two who complained about the, the big wigs, Miriam and Aaron, who complained about Moses' wife, God answered them by humbling them with a case of leprosy in front of the nation. He put the nation on notice about complaining against his leaders. Amen. Five quick lessons. And now, Jericho. So from the book of Joshua, chapter 6, we're going to do a little bit of reading today. Uh, 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 I hope you're ready for it. Mature Christians can handle this. And I'm going to try and get through this. Ooh, in the time allotted for myself. I have to say it like that. Joshua chapter 6 and verse number 1. Now Jericho was straightly shut up because of the children of Israel. None went out and none came in. Verse number 3. God speaking, and ye shall compass the, compass the city, all ye men of war, and go round about the city once. And this thus shalt thou do six days. Verse number four. And seven priests shall bear before the ark seven trumpets of ram's horns, and the seventh day ye shall compass the city seven times. And the priest shall blow the trumpets. Lesson number one, first lesson in this sermon for Achan. When facing a great situation, seek God first and let him lead you. And that was the significance of the priest going before and holding the, the Ark of the Covenant and the horns. That God goes before us when we let him in situations to secure the victory. God goes before us <clears throat> when we let him to secure the victory. Glory to God. Verse number five. And it shall come to pass that when they make a long blast which the, with the ram's horns, and when you hear the sound of the trumpet, all the people shall shout with a great shout, and the wall of the city shall fall down flat, and the people shall ascend every man straight before him. You got to talk about, if you're going to talk about Achan, you got to talk about Jericho. And Jericho was amazing. If I could describe the city uh, just a little bit. Could you put that up there, Brother Pete? So the, the, the walls of Jericho, and every, we've heard of this before, right? The walls of Jericho. The walls of Jericho was like a, a, a big hill raised up. But at the bottom of the hill, as you can see, was a wall. This wall was 13 feet high. And it was six feet deep. This wall. And it was into the hill that high, that deep, that strong, all the way around it up into the gates. And it also had towers on it. But it didn't stop there. That wall continued up to another wall, another fortified wall, which was nearly 20 feet tall, still six feet deep. And that is that right there. That is the image of the whole city. And this is what Jericho would have looked like. The first wall all the way around. The second wall, the first wall is the light part. Of the, I hope you can see that at the bottom. The light part at the bottom, that thing is 13 feet tall. And the next one is nearly 20 feet tall. So that wall coming all the way up would have been nearly 33 feet high. And this is the first one that was built like this that we have in history recorded, built 
like this. And as it was so deep, you would go in just a little ways where, and in that little ways, there was uh, uh, some settlements and stuff. And there was a third wall, a third wall that went up, yes, 13 feet high and six feet deep. So this was a strong city. Inside that city, they had a, 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 a spring, a source of water, and they had storehouses around that they would store their food. So they, as I said, they shut the doors and none went in or out. They were, they were fine. They had food, they had water, they had security. They ain't worrying about nothing and nobody. That's Jericho. And Jericho, <coughs> Jericho has a little significance uh, for us. Uh, one of the things that happened, I'm not going to go through the whole story, but it says that they'd walk around seven times and the, the Bible says that God would just knock the walls flat, flat, not a bunch of rumble, flat. And he knocked them flat so that that would be the ramp that the children of Israel would go in to conquer the land. But how does these six foot thick walls cave in? Well, they didn't have these terms back then. But those excavator people, those archaeologist people, when they dug down, you know what they said they found evidence of? An earthquake. An earthquake. Which is... Uh, which is to us, we understand earthquakes, but to them, how do you shout and an earthquake happens? You know how that happens? God. That's how that happens. God says, I'll tear it down. Uh, God will take care of that. Okay. So this is how uh, we, we got to Jericho being down. Okay. I skipped a whole lot of the story. That's okay. Uh, in Joshua chapter 6, verse number 17, there was a few more uh, directives that the Lord gave. And the city shall be accursed, even it and all that are therein, to the Lord. Only Rahab the harlot shall live, she and all that are with her in the house, because she hid the messengers that we sent. Verse 18, and ye in any wise... Anywise, keep yourselves from the accursed thing, lest you make yourselves accursed. When you take of the accursed thing and make the camp of Israel a curse, a trouble, and, and trouble it. The city accursed, all that's in a curse. Keep yourself from the accursed thing, lest you make yourself a curse when you take of the accursed things. In other words, in other words, if you go over and touch the accursed thing you take, you love the accursed thing. Not just you, but your, uh, not just you, but you bring it into your family. They will feel the effect of it. Uh, not just your family, you take it at your gathering with your friends, they will be affected. Not just your friends, take it to work, that will be affected. And not just your family, your friends, and your work, take it into church. That will be affected by the accursed thing. Lesson number two, it is important for people of God to remember this lesson of Jericho and identify the Jerichos in your life. The Jerichos in your life. Those things that are strong, impenetrable, that don't seem having the ability to crumble. You can't have access because nothing goes in or out. Those Battles of health. Those battles of, oh man, I can't get this better job. My finances, I just can't seem to get it straight. Those battles in my home with my children and my, my, my spouse. It's like a Jericho. So it is important for us to identify 
the Jerichos in our life. If we identify the Jerichos in our life, we see that God had a plan. And most of it, he said, it ain't about what you say out of your mouth. Shut up! Obey me, follow me, and do what I tell you to do. And when I tell you to, then praise God. Then give me a shout. Let everybody know that I did it. The victory of Jericho. Part number two. Do not take the Lord out of your small situations. So Jericho is over. Great victory. Great big victory. You know, the whole nation, they wiped out Jericho. Those walls came a-tumbling down like the song says. Everybody knows that Jericho has fallen. And they know that it wasn't about what the children of Israel did, but what their God did for them. Joshua chapter 7, verse number 3. And they returned... And they returned to Joshua and said unto him, let not all the people go up. Now, they had come to this other, the next battle they were facing. And it was, uh, it, it was to a place called Ai. And yes, that's the original Ai. It's not the Ai they talk about today. This was the original Ai. And as they came there, they sent spies to spy the land. How, how big a battle is this going to be? And verse number three, as we were saying, and they returned to Joshua and said, oh, let not all the people go up, but let, oh, about two or 3,000 men go up and smite Ai. And make not all the people to labor thither, for <clears throat> they are but a few. It's a small battle. Now, verse number four. So there went up thither of the people about 3,000 men, and they fled before the men of Ai. This little insignificant battle made them scared, and they ran. They fled. Uh, verse number five. And the men of Ai smote them, about 36 men, for they chased them from before the gate even to Shebarium, and smote them in the going down, wherefore the hearts of the people melted and became water. You ever face something that you're just afraid. I mean, it's a small thing, and for some reason, it just seems to kick you in the behind. You ever face something that you figured you could handle, and the next thing you know, you turn around and, whoa, putting a weapon on you. You're like, I don't even want to face that no more. This brings us to lesson number three. AI represents when we judge something too small to involve the Lord. And how we could lose that battle and wonder what happened. It, it, this shouldn't have been no thing. What happened? How come I couldn't just take this thing out? How come I couldn't conquer this? Because if we go back to the inception of it, we ask the question, did I let God lead in this one? Or did I just figure I could handle it? Hmm. The Bible says in 1 Peter chapter 5 and 7, casting all your care upon him, for he careth for you. Yes, saints. He cares for us, and God wants to have that kind of relationship with you. He don't want you to keep things from him. He wants you to share the intimate stuff. He wants you to share the small stuff. He wants you to think. He wants to hear from you. He wants to have really what they call a relationship. God wants that with his children. I don't have kids, but I've seen uh, people with kids. And you know what's one of the things that I notice? They watch those kids. They want to know what's going on. 
Same thing. And if you've had parents, you would, under, whether you had kids or not, but if you had parents, you would remember there were times when your parents was just up in your life, watching you, correcting you. Yeah. If you've been in any true relationship, there is supposed to be to and a from. There is supposed to be an amount of care. Casting all your care upon him, for he careth for you. So after this happened, after the men of Ai chased them away, that little battle just really kicked them in the touche. After that, Joshua fell on his face. Oh, Lord, 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 Lord. Why? Why? Why did this happen to us? Joshua chapter 7. Verse number 11. The Lord answers him. It says, Israel hath sinned, and they have also transgressed my covenant, which I commanded them, for they have even taken of the accursed thing and have also stolen, disassembled, and also they have put it even among their stuff. Verse number 12. And this is the verse that should scare us. This is the warning. Therefore, the children of Israel could not stand before their enemies, but turned their backs before their enemies because they were accursed. And God says, neither will I be with you anymore. Because taking of the accursed thing, God is like, I, I, I am a holy God. I can't go where things ain't right. I can't go. If it's not holy, I can't go there. Clean it up, and I can return. But as for now, no, no, no. I'm not going to be with I can't be with you. I can't. Except you destroy the accursed thing. Part three. Part three, the spirit that took Achan, the spirit. It, it is good to identify, don't, don't just put Achan's face on it, recognize that there is a spirit involved. We talked on Wednesday a little bit about the spirit of Balaam and, and what it did, how it, it, went, it didn't uh, directly attack the people's faith, but it put a stumbling block in front of them because it knew that if I put a stumbling block, you're more apt to fall. And of course, that stomach stumbling block was, of course, idolatry and fornication. And it caused thousands, thousands to lose their life. Well, there is also here a spirit of Achan. Now, if we could uh, skip down, you could read the rest of it for your homework. But if we could skip down to verse number 20, the Bible goes on to say here, and, and so they, what they did was they had, in the request before God, God said, take the people, take the people. In other words, let them come before you, and the ones that I signify to you, that's the ones you hold, you hold and you pull them to. And so they went by tribe by tribe, and it fell on to Judah. It went family by family, mean, meaning the whole big family. And then it went household by household. And then it went man by man, and they got to Achan here. And Achan answered, verse 20, and Achan answered Joshua and said, Indeed, I have sinned against the Lord God of Israel, and thus and thus have I done. When I saw the spoils of a goodly Babylonian garment and, 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 and 200 shekels of silver and 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 a wedge of gold of 50 shekels weighed then. Oh, hey, I coveted them. I coveted them. And I took them. And behold, they are hid in the earth in the midst of my tent and the silver under it. And the silver under it. Before this moment here, before Ai, Achan had a chance to repent. He had a chance to get it right. 
He had a chance to say, God, I'm sorry. Whatever I need to do to get this thing right, I have sinned, transgressed. I'm sorry, God. Let, let me know what I have to do to get it right. But no, he waited for God to call him out. I'm sure he's sorry now, but he's more sorry that he got called out. More so than what he did. Verse number 24. And Joshua and all Israel with him took Achan, the son of Zerah, and the silver and the garment and the wedge of gold and his sons and his daughters and his oxen and his asses and his sheep and his tent and all he had. And they brought them into the valley of Achor verse number 25 and Joshua said why hast thou troubled us the Lord shall trouble thee this day and all Israel stoned him with stones and burned them with fire and they after they had stoned them with stones and they and verse 26, and they raised over them a great heap of stones unto this day. So the Lord turned from the fierceness of his anger, wherefore the name of that place was called the Valley of Acre unto this day. So we're talking about the spirit that took Achan. Let's identify this. Back in verse number 21, when I saw among the spoils a goodly Babylonian garment, Babylonian garment, and 200 shekels of silver, and a wedge of gold, and 50 shekels of weight, then I coveted them, and took them, and behold. The spirit that enticed Achan was covetousness. Covetousness. You know what else covetousness is known as? Lust. The spirit that took Achan was lust. Where does lust come from? Can, can we ask that in church? Where does lust come from? It'd be great to have this as a study sometime. But we don't have that today. So let's just talk a little bit about where lust comes from. The spirit that took Achan. From the book of John chapter 8, verses, starting at verses 42 to 44. And Jesus said, if God were your father, you would love me. For I have proceeded forth and came from God. Neither came I of myself, but he sent me. So the Lord says, if God were your father, ye would love me. Verse 43, why do you not understand my speech, even because you cannot hear my word? Verse number 44, ye are of your father, the devil, and the lust of your father ye will do. The lust of your father you will do. He was a murderer from the beginning and abode not in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh it of his own, for he is a liar and a father of it. Lust comes from not loving the Lord Jesus. Lust comes from not loving the Lord Jesus. Amen. Was the Lord Jesus around in Achan's time? Well, let's do this right quick. From the book of John, chapter 1, verse 1. And the Bible says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Verse number 14. And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory as the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. So the flesh wasn't there, but God's word was. Telling him not to touch the accursed thing. But he was enticed to want the goodly clothes and gold and silver more than God's word. That, that's the, and the last uh, of the Ten Commandments simply says, the last one, the very, it, it's, a one, it's one of the ones that doesn't get a whole lot of attention, but it says, 
thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's house, thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's wife, nor his manservant, nor his maidservant, nor his ox, nor his ass, nor anything that is thy neighbor's. What was the first covetousness? And I want to identify this spirit uh, right quick. So whenever you find yourself in the throes of being way tempted, way, I, 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 I just got to have it. I don't know. I, I, I can't have no power over this. Where did that spirit come from? From the book of Isaiah, chapter 14 and verse 14. The Bible says, I will ascend upon above the heights of the clouds. There is one who has said this. He will walk up and down the midst of the stones. He will be, as it says, I will be like the Most High. There's one. There's one who thought that I see God Almighty. All I, that's what I want. I want it that way. God Almighty is and has. Where did it come from? It came from Lucifer. It, that spirit is, has been around for a long, long time, the spirit of lust. Part four, our transgressions affect more than just us. So if we could, uh, if we could just do this and look at what Achan, what God gave Achan. Number one, he gave him to be part of his people that made it through the wilderness. God let him be one of his children. Hallelujah. What else did God give him? He gave him to see the victories that God did for his people. The victories, all those victories we read about. Man, Achan got a chance to see that stuff. What else did God give him? Sons and daughters and oxen and asses and sheep. And a house, a tent, for all his dwelling. What else did God give him? After all that, Achan let something of the world take him away from his privilege in God. And lastly, God gave him a space of repentance. He didn't send a lightning bolt right away. He gave him time to get it right. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for giving us time to get it right. Thank you, Lord. Lesson number five, and I'm wrapping up here. God made an example out of everything Achan had to purge it out, to purge it all out, that the children of Israel were not contaminated by his actions. Because there's, their actions brought separation between them and their God. Isaiah 59 and 1, the Bible quickly says, Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened that it cannot save, neither is there heavy that it cannot save. But, but, but your iniquities have separated between you and your God, and your sins have hid his face from you that he will not hear. Amen. God wanting to bless him. And he put something in the way to keep God out. God intended. He had been blessing them all along. And Achan put something in the way to keep God out. And it, it, it cost the lives of his entire family. It cost all of them. Part five, this is it. God gave us the pen and the paper. God gave us the pen and the paper. I, uh, I, I have a concern today, brothers and sisters, and it is a concern for the holiness of the church. Uh, with so many things going on in the world, we have to be careful not to let the spirit of Balaam come in onto us to entice us and deceive us and distract us away from serving our Lord and Savior in the beauty of holiness. Amen. Did you know God don't like halfway stuff? Right. I, I, I used to be really good at being halfway. Yeah, non-committal, my foot touching in the water, and that's all I'm going to give. Oh, you, you want me to be there? I, I, I'll probably be there. Halfway stuff. Used to be really good. God don't like that. 
I uh, heard this person uh, say she used to be a Christian. And she used to believe that God was a loving God who gave people free will. And because of that, she tried to tell everybody uh, to, be, to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ that they could be saved. And uh, up until she read a scripture that talked about how uh, God had raised Pharaoh up that God could show. And she really slanted the scripture. She didn't read uh, the scripture. She slanted it, gave her what she had thought it said. That God had raised Pharaoh up and, and just so he could wipe out everything. That God was mean and God really had, had, had something against him. And Pharaoh never had a choice. But the Bible doesn't say he didn't have a choice. He did have a choice. Every time Moses went up to him. He had a choice. He could have easily have said, I know I'm feral. I know I got all this stuff, but you're saying some really interesting things to me. I never heard these things before. You're telling me there's one greater than me. Tell me more. He had that opportunity, but he made it harder for people to prove that, hey, there's nobody greater than me. And then he had to be humbled. It was still a choice. Lesson number six, last lesson. What this person didn't realize is the Almighty not only had given them life and blessings, but God had also given them a canvas and a binder. God had given them the tools for writing a book. God has given us the tools for writing a book. It's called a life. And so, I'm writing a book. Right now, that book is 63 and two days old. <laughs> and in that book, it's called The Book of Parish. And that book has my faults and failures. It has my repentance and my hard-heartedness. It has the times when I'm happy, laughing out of turn, don't make no sense. It has when I have been obnoxious, arrogant, the book of perish. And it also has when I have repented, the book of perish. Everyone here, we're all writing a book. Every one of us, the whole canvas. So, uh, well, the Bible says in 1 John chapter 2, 15 through 17, I'm just going to read the first and the, and the last verse. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. And verse number 17, and the world passeth away and the lust thereof. But he that doeth the will of God abideth ever. And the world passes away and the lust thereof. But he that doeth the will of God abideth ever. The lesson we learn from Achan is love God and love his word. Amen. Last comment. God in his infinite mercy and wonderful grace has given us a beautiful remedy. And this is it. Romans chapter 12 and verse number 2. Be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. May God add a blessing to the reading of his word. God bless you, saints. Amen.